Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have an amazing guest. His name is Terrence, and I will let him introduce himself. Who are you? Yeah, so my name is uh, Terrence Lester, and I am residing in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually a native of Atlanta, Georgia, and I am the executive director and founder of a nonprofit organization called Love Beyond Walks. Amazing. Um, so I started following Terrence because I, I kept getting notifications for the inspirational quotes that he was posting um, regarding disabilities and being visible in the community. And um, that's how we followed each other. I decided to reach out and, you know, I wanted his story on our show uh, to kind of share with parents and other community members. Um, so today's topic is um, facing adversity. Um, and the reason why the topic came up is that, you know, your story is one of adversity and I love how you have been able to, with the help of your family and your community, kind of face that adversity and um, grow as an individual. So before we get into the topic, I wanted to ask you, what is your profession? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for, you know, your platform and um, talking about sensitive subjects uh, such as these. Uh, but I would say my profession is I am an advocate. I am a uh, executive director and nonprofit leader. Um, and I also am a writer and I'm a public speaker. So I've been doing that for uh, leading a nonprofit for about a decade. Uh, and I've been being a public speaker and writer for a little over 15 years. That's amazing. So what made you decide to pursue the that career? And, and um, I mean, like in the avenue of advocacy, what made you become an advocate? Like what was it that you saw in your community that made you feel so strongly about that you wanted to speak out against it or, you know, lend your voice to the cause? Yeah. So I, I would, when I'm asked this question, I'm always um, very vulnerable um, in that advocacy for me did not happen as it relates to like anything hobby related or some type of trend, um, my advocacy work grew out of uh, personal pain um, that I experienced in my life. The thing that I'm advocating for is something that I also overcame myself. Uh, so we advocate on behalf of those who are unhoused uh, and marginalized and excluded uh, from criminalizing ordinances and or mistreatment uh, from larger society. And so I experienced homelessness uh, when I was a teenager. I know what it's like to sleep in parks, um, to be overlooked, uh, to not have someone fully understand the context of your story and how you arrive uh, in a certain uh, place. And so it kind of grew out of uh, this notion of pain, something that I struggled through and then uh, you know, gaining access to like people who would become my community, like my friends, fathers, and uh, kind of speak to me about my future and what I could become. And, um, you know, educators who kind of got around me and poured into my life in a way that gave me some semblance of hope. Um, I think the, the second phase of that became more education. I saw education as a way um, to not only be aware of the realities uh, structurally that vulnerable communities face, but also it gave me a way to imagine myself in places that um, didn't have violence or harm. Right. Uh, I use books as a way of uh, seeing myself beyond my, my environment uh, and the gaps that I had in my life. And then, I would, I would say thirdly, um, because I'm a person of faith, it, it kind of, my heart was just kind of wired to say, like, how can I use my life in a way 
actively uh, to make a difference in the world. You know, I've been pained by this. I see this uh, contextually, uh, in whether it was written articles or books that I, I was reading, and I see it visibly in my community. But then I started to ask myself, like, how can I actually make a tangible difference? And that's when I started exploring uh, different ideas about how I could start an organization and, and possibly leverage my story uh, to advocate, but also to educate others who ha have not been proximate to communities that have been oppressed. That's amazing. Um, coming from the inner city, because I'm, I'm in New York City, I don't know if you know, but coming from the New York, from New York City and um, coming from an impoverished neighborhood, it's really, like, it's very shocking to see people that are unhoused still and to see people in your community that are at the borderline almost of becoming unhoused, you know? So the work that you're doing is like, it just really touches my heart because it's like, honestly, sometimes you don't know how to help or what to do. And it's so easy to judge and point the finger and like assume the worst of people for, you know, for, for being in those situations, which a lot of the time they don't even have control over really. So it's like, the education piece I love and also the advocacy piece as well to um, be able to affect change and, and change legislation regarding the unhoused. Um, it's very powerful. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit. I know that you experienced an accident that was basically life changing for you um, recently. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, as long as it's not triggering for you and kind of, walk us through what that experience was like and how it changed you as a man. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, thank you again for giving me a, a space to share uh, my journey. I remember uh, it was May 13th. Um, my wife and myself were invited to this gathering um, to celebrate young professionals and kind of <clears throat> um, our organization was being highlighted in a way that would just um, kind of honor the work that the organization has done on behalf of the unhoused. And it was like a celebratory moment. And so we go and uh, the organization was highlighted and people were made more aware of like the struggles of those who are unhoused. And so we left and the very next day um, we told our friends and we were like, Hey, you know, let's go out to dinner and just kind of celebrate this moment. Because sometimes when you achieve something, you know, the normal thing is to move on to the next thing mm -hmm. and not really relish or like savor the moment. And I think we do a, a very horrible job with that in society but we go out to dinner and uh we're leaving dinner it was around 11 p.m and i asked my wife if she didn't mind driving and she agreed and uh i fell asleep in a passenger seat and the next thing i know i, I wake up on the ground um and there were emts running over to me and i could hear like people yelling like uh, flip him over to see it's check his vitals to see if he's still alive. Mm -hmm. And I kind of blacked out again. And, and then I came to, and I saw my wife running towards me. Um, and, and the next thing I know, I, I'm, I wake up in the, um, in the hospital with, you know, doctors telling me that they were going to have to perform like emergency surgery on my, um, on my leg. And my hip, because my hip and my pelvis were uh, crushed. And um, I was like, what type of surgery? And and so they had to put a pin in my lower leg uh, to pull uh, the femur forward and put weights on it because it was close to my nerve, mm -hmm. um, like damaging it severely and, um, and close to an artery. 
and so yeah they operated and then i was um scheduled for surgery the next day and then they operated again and i i spent a month in a hospital i remember uh when i found out uh that it was just going to be a long process and like i would have long-term effects uh from this injury uh, the doctor had come to me after surgery and he was, he was like, we had a successful surgery. And I was like, Oh, okay. Cause in my mind, I'm thinking like, I, that's, I'm it, just gonna, that's it. Like, mm-hmm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm done. And he was like, no, uh, we're going to have to keep you. And I was like, keep me. And he was like, yeah, it's going to be a while before you can, um, walk again. And, um, oh my God. Yeah, that kind of crushed me. Like, I not crushed me in the way where it's like, um, it was just shocking, right? Like, it was, it was like your life is moving in a rhythm that you're accustomed to, and then something disrupts that and it reorients everything. And so I went from being oriented to disorientation, mm. which is, um, something that became, um, like a, a huge blow for me. Yeah. Um, I remember after being in the hospital, like it was, it was a community hospital. So a lot of, um, people who don't have insurance access that hospital unhoused community because, you know, it's the number one hospital in, in the whole state for trauma, specifically okay. the injury that I had. And when I was admitted to the hospital, I remember hearing around me at night, like people yelling out, somebody help me. Why aren't you giving me my medication? You know, oh my God. Um, there were times when I was ghosted by nurses and like had my medication stolen um, and not like giving me my medication and going through that pain and the irony of like being an advocate for people whose voices have been silenced or like impoverished. And then also going through the mistreatment um, of like how it literally feels, whether you have, you know, no insurance or like however people view you Mm -hmm. or like, or insurance, or insurance, it did. It did not matter. I was just in this environment where the mistreatment was a part of the culture. Wow. Um, and it was it was very toxic. And like I was trying to fight to get out. Like my wife had to get involved and um, like advocate for me and different things. And I, I started to think about the number of uh, poor folks who haven't been taught to advocate for themselves or never even had that, that space to know what it feels like to advocate for yourself or even having people to advocate on your behalf um, and feel that connection. And, and so it was just like a a really hard journey um, starting that uh, process. I spent 26 days in the hospital and then, you know, another um, week or so, in um, inpatient care uh, before I was able to come home. Wow, that must have been like some some experience. Um, as people of color, we go through so much with the medical system, but then like on top of that and being in that type of hospital, like I can just, I can sort of imagine a little bit like what your experience was like, but it's really, at this day and age, it shouldn't be happening, you know, but it still is, which is so powerful that you're talking about the advocacy piece because I, 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 through my platform, I'm also educating parents about advocacy for their children with special needs. And oh, not only that, but also like even mothers that are pregnant, that are in the hospital, that they're dealing with, you know, the medical system, a lot of things go fly under the radar and are permitted in hospitals that should not be permitted. And then the thing is that the the, the education piece is missing because a lot of people don't know what their rights are. 
Your doctor right. can plan, of course, of action, but you are entitled to tell them no. And you can advocate for yourself. And if you don't like your doctor, you can always advocate to switch hospitals, doctors, whoever. You know, obviously you have to advocate for yourself and it's not just going to happen like easily, but right. you know, you, you, you are always in the right. You can always change your care. And that's something that I really wanted to, um, you know, harp on that you mentioned. Um, so, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you, I, I think what you're saying is so important because, you know, most times people who hold any type of, you know, specialized role, are deemed as people of importance and people who have power. Mm -hmm. um, but just because a person has a role of importance doesn't necessarily mean that they have power over you Yes, is what you're saying that you have the power to decide what doctor you go to, what doctor you allow into your space to walk with you through your journey, mm -hmm. uh, what doctor you choose to advise you, on medical standings, et cetera. And I think sometimes when people, you know, are struggling with poverty, um, we tend to defer, you know, our rights and, you know, our voice to those who we deem as more powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got to remind folks that, you know, you're, pow you're just as powerful, you know? Yes. And resources does not dictate worth. Uh, you know what I mean? Like we all have, uh, we all have worth no matter what so social location we emerge from. Yeah. And whether you have private insurance or Medicaid, or you don't right. have any insurance at all, you, you still have the same rights as right. anybody in the hospital. That's so right. how did this experience shape your opinion about disabilities and the rights of people with disabilities in the, in the U S I feel like that's something that there has been so many, uh, there have been so many uh, legislate, there has been so much legislature to defend disabilities, but I feel like there's still so much that needs to be done. And the fact that, the fact that um, people are still dealing with this is, is, to me is like crazy, but, um, just like kind of tell me how has it shaped your opinion about the rights of people with disabilities here in the States? Yeah. Well, I mean, personally, um, I've always been an advocate of any, uh, uh, persons that have been excluded or oppressed in some way. Um, personally, my son, uh, has a, um, a disability. And, um, so my heart has always been open to, um, creating space mm -hmm. and margin, uh, for, for people to be their, their full selves in the ways, um, in the ways that they're, um, of, you know, able or uh afforded to and um i think um you know i've always like it's been sensitive uh to me because it's mm -hmm. my own child and um me and my wife we have walked alongside my son and honored him in the ways that he has been created beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in his expression of his life. And, um, and so I guess my heart is just like, as a father has always been like, you know, wanting to see, uh, people who are living with a disability shine, right. Mm -hmm. In a way that is honoring to them. Um, but personally after the accident, I started to um, really make the connection of how people value, like how people place worth on ability, like ability to show up, ability to keep a schedule, ability to do certain tasks, ability to speak, ability to go here, ability to go there. And I started to see how people 
almost disconnected or, you know, stop talking to me as, as much because I wasn't able to perform those abilities. And it was very heartbreaking. Ugh. Um, and it all, all in many ways, it caused me to question my, my own worth, uh, in the beginning, because it was like, like, you know, am I worthy? You know, you start having these questions, you know, um, like my work is my worth beyond what I'm able to produce. Right. <laughs> um, and so like, I really struggled with that. And then I was reminded, uh, by one of my professors about how my worth had nothing to do with whether I was in a wheelchair or not. Yeah. Um, whether I was using walkers or not. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it took me longer to do something or not, whether I needed to rest my body longer uh, than I had before or not, my worth was just here because I exist, I'm breathing, yes. um, and people love me because of that. Um, but it was a struggle because there were times when I would go out in restaurants. I remember this one time I was out with my family and I was using my walker. I mean, I mean, I'm literally trying to learn to walk again, and mm -hmm. the doctors are not knowing if they need to do a third surgery. And this lady and her kid was just, like, looking at me, and the the mother was, like, making faces, like, mocking me. <gasps> and the kid was, they were laughing at me um, at the table, and I, I remember my kids were there. And, like, I just, oh I just broke down. And then I started to realize, like, every building – does not have, you know, uh, ADA accommodations mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, try either whether it's walking through doors or like the restrooms or like access and, and seating or whatever it was. It's just like it was a new world that opened up to me because I'm literally walking in um, what it means to live with a temporary disability and. Mm -hmm. It was just eye opening. Wow. <clears throat> yep. That's such a powerful experience and like kind of shifting your mindset from being completely able to do all these things to now having limited mobility and being looked at differently because you are now using um, a walker or crutches rather you know, to, to move around. And the fact that that lady had the audacity, like it just yeah. really grinds my gears. And then the thing is that a lot of the time when people are disabled, they are seen as invisible by other people. And that's one of the things that I really want to drive home with my show is that even though somebody does something differently than you do, that person is just as valid, just as worthy, just as powerful, if not yes. more so than that as you, you know? So, so especially like with a, a lot of the time, I, I, I work a lot with children with autism and there are some children that are nonverbal, right? They're not able to express themselves. Um, they don't have expressive language. They do have receptive language. They understand everything that's going on. But the fact that because they can't speak, people disregard them as a, as a human as an individual, they don't take them into account. It just drives me crazy because it's like, you know, this is another human being. How how is it that you're not really looking at that person as a person? And I and I feel like that kind of right. goes a little bit hand in hand with the you know the way people look at the unhoused as well because it's like. You know, they, they marginalize these people and they, you know, set them to the side and disregard them in a way in society. Right. Right. And it's like um, this, that invisibility piece, like invisibility strips a person from um, having an expression of their existence. Mm -hmm. um, heard or seen or um, embraced or included. Um, and I think we have to like redefine how we uh, create belonging for people yes. uh, living with a 
uh, disability. Uh, one of the things that I started to think about to, um, I'll never forget the first time I, I went out, like my wife uh, helped me load the, um, the wheelchair and we went to a coffee shop and I hadn't been in this coffee shop in a while. And I remember um, riding past this guy who was unhoused and he had a um, like a, a walker mm -hmm. and a wheelchair and I made my way over to him and we were talking and he, he was talking about how, you know, the walker was not the right size. The wheelchair was not the right size. Yeah. And, you know, on top of like living with a disability, you're also discarded as a human because you are unhoused. And my heart just, um, just broke. And I, I really resonate with what you're saying is that we have to create, counter narratives, counter narratives, right? Yes. Uh, to challenge the status quo narratives, narratives or the dominant narratives that persist and continuously make people see others as being less than or invisible. When mm -hmm. in reality, uh, there are people who are living with a disability and or unhoused that are just as capable, uh, just as worthy, um, and just as um, important as any other person who has ability. Yes, I love that. Thank you so much for saying that. So, I mean, I know why and um, why why you why you chose to work with the unhoused, but was there anything else like besides coming from that experience in your teenage years? Was there any other? experiences that stand out like as a child or you know later on in life that made you create this beautiful associate this beautiful organization love beyond the walls yeah i mean <clears throat> you know when you when you talk about invisibility like i'm a, i guess I, i'm a person that just feels deeply you know, I know what it feels like to be overlooked. Um, I know what it feels like to be uh, deemed a black sheep or an outcast. Mm -hmm. I know what that uh, translates into, like, sociologically uh, being excluded from certain things. You know, and, and the feeling of the experience of homelessness, uh, like, you know can be translated into so many other experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, I guess the, the challenges that I faced coming up just kind of prepared my voice and my outlook on life mm -hmm. um, and just prepared my heart like to serve. And I, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to just like chase capital like you know what i mean like yeah. a bunch of money i wanted to contribute um my life in some way I, i'll never forget i was about to turn 17 i was in an alternative school and i just made the decision to drop out of high school um i'm walking away from the school uh with my friends and i'll never forget this this guy who was experiencing homelessness called over to like our little crowd or whatever and I was the only one to respond and so I turn aside I walk up to this guy he didn't ask me for you know any money or anything uh, he just asked me you know is that your school back there and I was like yeah he was like looking at himself up and down he told me that I should um, whatever you do he says whatever you do young man you know make sure you get an education uh, because you don't want to end up like me and he didn't know at that time, like I, I was like living out of my car. I just contemplated like dropping out of high school, all of these things. He was just kind of like speaking into my life. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the first person to call me a leader, right? A man on the street, right? Um, and that always stuck with me. Uh, and that conversation was one of the reasons why, you know, I, I graduated. I went back to school. I graduated. Um, and pretty soon I'll, I'll finish uh, my PhD 
And I love my that. whole yeah. Um my whole like dissertation is centered around the criminalization of homelessness, uh social and political rhetoric, social constructions, how we uh, speak words and create frames in which people like see others through, uh, similar to everything that you're talking about. And, um, it just became like a passion to me because I just have a passion to, to make sure that those people who are, who feel invisible, right. Um, have a home and what home is just more than four walls and the roof, right? Yeah. Home is, where you're uh, seen, where you're accepted, and where you feel like you belong. And so, like, I, my my life's passion is just to create more belonging uh, for folks who are overlooked. I love that. Creating more inclusive environments where everybody feels seen and heard and valued as a, as a human being is so important. Um, wow. I love this. Um, so... <laughs> so- during okay, so Love Beyond Walls does so much. Can you like highlight some of the things that you, some of the initiatives that you guys have worked on throughout the years um, for the audience? Yeah, um, um, we've uh, done anything from you know housing uh, people in mobile RV units, helping people transition. I think uh, we've helped a little over five hundred people. Uh, get off of the streets. Uh, We've been known for doing uh, national campaigns, like uh, the one in the pandemic that we did when everybody was talking about like washing their hands. I came up with the concept of putting hand washing stations like in the streets and under bridges and that kind of spread from Atlanta uh, to all around the United States. I think it's in, um, I think 89 cities or so. Yeah, uh, I saw that on your website. Having, That's amazing. Yeah, having access to sanitation. Uh, we built self-contained showers. Uh, we launched a, a museum that's educating uh, folks around the subject of homelessness. Uh, we've done food co-op, co-ops, uh, clothing closets, free access to washing machines. I mean, um, like uh, the mobile makeover bus where it's like a mobile barbershop. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I think one of the, the things that I would like to highlight is that all of those things that I've named are just vehicles uh, to be in relationship with people. Mm-hmm. Um, because for us, it's always been about, you know, relationships, getting to know the person, getting to know their story, um, their hopes, their fears, their dreams, you know, their shortcomings uh, and wrapping their lives with like community, like providing a community for them. Because as you said earlier, like there are not a lot of people who have access to communities where they feel like they fully belong. Right. Yeah. And so like love beyond walls has always just been an organization trying to figure out how can we take excess to solve a problem like excess, like you got RV units, standing uh sitting around and there's nothing being used you got a bus that's not being used like we can transform these into like spaces and places that uh, provide or meet uh these these needs of individuals who are just as worthy um but it's also been a, about bringing people together uh which is i mean it emanates from like my pain and my my life story um you know, a bunch of people who were strangers at the time became family to me, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, saw my worth and value beyond my circumstances. And so, you know, I'm just trying to, to live that out personally. And we're trying to live that out through our organization. Awesome. So can you share some of your most memorable moments during while you've had this organization during the program? Yeah. I mean, I can talk about, um, I remember one time we, we launched this museum, uh, in 2019 called Dignity Museum. Um, and it's the first museum in the United States that represents the subject of homelessness. It's housed in the shipping container. And we were leading these tours 
and a person had come into the museum and they're like looking at the stories and pictures on the wall and the screen and listening to audio recordings and all of these things. And the person actually ran and like found their aunt <laughs> um, because uh, our organization had worked with um, uh, their aunt and we were able to reunite them. Oh my God. Um, yeah. There's other times when, you know, um, I remember uh, this one individual uh, who's a friend had been out of touch with their family for 30 years. Um, and we had a volunteer like come in to like just donate an hour a week. Um, and they ended up meeting and the volunteers like, well, I have a, you know, a skill of research, you know, that's kind of like in my profession, my wheelhouse. And I want to use this mm-hmm. to help you find your family. And the, the volunteer, the volunteer actually ended up helping this person find uh, his, his family, like after 30 years, you know. Oh my God. I love that. Oh yeah. 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 It's funny because but, like, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just, yeah, just like reunification stories, like people going from living behind buildings or in cars to like having like adequate housing. I mean, the whole, it's just all about people, uh, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that it's, it's, that is like something about Twitter, right? Like, I wanted to say that through Twitter, like the, the, you see the power, right. Of people coming together. Not that necessarily that what's happening with Twitter right now is like the best thing ever. Right. But you see the power of people when people unite, you know, we can do so many things. And, and, and I feel like those stories are a testament to that, you know, coming together as a community, as, you know, as human beings, and seeing each other and holding space for each other is so impactful um, that, you know, things like that can happen, which is amazing. Because the thing is, like, we feel like the world is so big, but it's really through connections with people and talking to other humans, it, it, the world becomes a little smaller, which is dope. I right. Think it's so dope. It's so dope. And... You know, the point that you're making is about the world being small is a really huge point. And I think, uh, you know, to add to what you're saying is you also have to be open, right? Um, you have to be open uh, to meet new people, to have new experiences, to uh, pursue new opportunities, Um and open to like lend your voice to advocating for whatever it is, you know, because, <clears throat> and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to like encourage people to like erase their boundaries because I think boundaries are healthy, but I think there's something to being open in a way where you can be a part of like this collective that you're talking about. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So what have been some of the, what has been some of the major impacts that you've seen in the community and um, you're, you guys are in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. 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 So what have, what has been some of the impact that you have seen um, in the community? I mean, I love that hand washing station idea that that was like, when I read it on your website, I was like, wow. But um, what other things have you seen um, through the community or like even personal, not personal, but like um, small stories of people that you guys have worked with that you have seen like a turnaround in their lives? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen a lot of change, I think, in any major uh, city there's a lot of change when it comes to the unhoused community. Um, You know, there's, it goes from like growing interest to solve the problem to, Oh, let's put boulders under bridges and like 
uh, place hostile architecture everywhere, right? And and so like there's this ebb and flow of um how this community is being perceived, um, which is it's heartbreaking, but it's also like motivating uh, to to be more of an advocate in the community. Like mm -hmm. I remember during the pandemic, uh, we saw like hotels being occupied, right? Um, and space being created for uh, the unhoused community, which, um, you know, funding and stuff kind of ran out and people started to transition back, which is the downside of that. Mm. Um, but personally, as an organization, um, we've seen a lot of people that we've been able to work with, like one on one. I remember a family of seven. Um, uh, reached out to us and was like living out of their cars like this time last year, right? Oh my god! Mm -hmm. um, you know, kids going to school and they were using coats for blankets in their car the night before. Um, mother and father like doing the best that they can in two cars, uh, trying to like keep their family unit together because for the mother and the children who are of age could stay in a shelter, but the whole situation of shelters not accepting whole families. I mean, it's just, it was, um, it was hard, but our organization was able to walk with them uh, through uh, many of those challenges uh, where they are actually able to get stable housing. Wow. I can tell you stories. Like I remember meeting um, a good friend of mine now, uh, behind a building um he was once in corporate america uh ended up you know experiencing homelessness and he's looking for something to eat in the in the garbage bin behind our, our um, facility and instead of calling the police i kind of um befriended him uh learned his story and our organization kind of uh walked with him out of the experience of homelessness it took us eight months mm. to secure his birth certificate birth certificate because you need ID to get ID. Yes. Um, and we had to get a attorney involved and all of those things. And um, I'll never forget. Uh, we launched a campaign called hire Mark where I, I wore this big sandwich board um, downtown and it was on the news and like his resume was shared like thousands of times. And, uh, within six days, he got a job offer, and so that launched him back into the tech, uh, a tech career. Oh wow! Um, and yeah, and then he got his own place, and then Mark just literally got married and relocated to uh, Louisiana uh, last amazing. year. So yeah, uh, during that whole process, he was able to reunite with his daughter. Um, it was just. I mean, many, many different stories I can tell you on and on, but I, I don't want to share those stories to say, look at what we're doing. I'm, I'm sharing those stories because I think it's important to know that with the right community, um, people can achieve anything because yes. it's in them. It's not in us. Mm -hmm. um, what we have the opportunity to do is just like, create space for people to be their full selves. You know? Even the language that you're using, you're saying our, our organization walked with them. It's not like you're like, you know, have this um, savior syndrome, right? That you're like, oh, we're here, Superman. We're, you know, taking care of these people and we're just saving them. No, you're walking with them, which is very powerful. Like when I think about the Bible, remember the, the, the quote about the footprints in the sand, right? You're walking with them yeah. to help them get themselves back to, you know, a, 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 a situation that is, that is going to be conducive for them to be able to thrive. Right. So I, I even love like the language that you have around that. So I wanted to ask you a little bit. I wanted to dig a little more. So. Your organization is so special. I know that you have to have some kind of like secret formula to hire people to work in your organization. So what is it that you look for when you're looking for people to be part of the staff of Love Beyond Walls? 
Yeah. I think that's, um, thank you for asking that question, uh, because it, it's reminding me of, like, I'm sitting in my office right now and I have whiteboard next to me. I remember the day I wrote this question on the board, like, what has pained you in your life? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was inspired by a chapter I had read in the book, uh, and uh, it was written by Dave Gibbons. And in the chapter, he says, um, sometimes God will use your greatest pain to lead you to your destiny. And mm-hmm. so, like, I'm really, like, reflecting on this this question. And I remember listing all of the things that I, I mentioned earlier, like Black Sheep and Outcast. I mean, personally, that's those are the things that I feel like I feel pain around. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I'll never forget saying, like, if I ever became a leader, like, I just want to do things from my heart. Like, I want to, I want to make sure that people feel important, um, that their stories are heard, not with like <clears throat> the hurry up and tell me kind of mentality that we have these days or not with like the attention deficit where we can't pay attention to someone's story because we're ready to move on to something else, like really allowing people space to like be themselves in that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to do things with like a, um, a servant's heart. And I'm, I'm naming these things because like most times when I meet people, that's what I'm looking for. Like, do you want to just do this because you want attention Mm -hmm. or do you really want to do this because it's in your heart? Right. Yeah. Um, Do you want to do this because you want to be seen or do you want to do this because you understand that there's somebody vulnerable and have been made to feel invisible that needs to be seen. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking for people who have qualities like, you know, sacrifice, like not sacrifice in a way where it becomes like, toxic to yourself where you just constantly putting yourself on the altar of things. But like, are you willing to go the extra mile in a way that makes a person um, have their inherent worth and value affirmed? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's the small things like, are you willing to do, you know, something that may not be as glamorous, you know, because yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like, in my heart, what I think of a leader, like I'm looking for leaders who are countercultural to what we think a leader should be. Like, I don't think about leadership in terms of like, oh, I just want to be seen. It's like, I think of it as in the way of like, I just want to serve. Like, yes. I'm looking for like people who have servants' hearts as opposed to like people who only want to have power and acclaim and all of those things, because that's not, that's not how I started. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I, I want to keep that in the, the heartbeat of like the culture, you know, long after I'm, I'm gone. So. I love that. So I wanted to ask you, what do you envision for love beyond walls in the next five years? Yeah. You know, right now I'm, um, I have a lot of ideas about where I would like for Love Beyond Walls to go. Um, but I think I'm, I'm truly honoring the space I'm in as a leader, uh, going through my healing journey Mm -hmm. in terms of like recovering. Like I can tell you, like, I. I would like for the organization to create more educational awareness and advocacy for um, the unhoused community, but also expanding that to uh, people who are living with disabilities and are also unhoused. Yeah. Um, Like being really specific about that, because I don't think there's enough educational awareness around, around that. Yeah. Um, and like continuing to lead the charge to create more like innovative initiatives to advocate for housing, uh, housing rights, 
uh, not just here in Atlanta, but all across the country um, and even globally. And, um, you know, I, I would like for the organization to also think of ways to develop more leaders who are like servant leaders that are empathetic yeah. um, because I, you can be a leader. You don't have to have a huge platform. Like you can make change right in your community. Mm -hmm. um, but most people are sometimes afraid of that. Like we were talking about earlier when you said you got to use your voice, you know, you got to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who have been oppressed by like systems and structures or even um, uh, being oppressed by impoverishment that don't necessarily see themselves as leaders. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, really um, creating space for people to find their sense of worth in leadership in whatever capacity that is. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking and I'm dreaming and, you know, um, I'm healing as well. I love that. So I know you do so much, right? You're a, you're a family man, you're a dad and you're a husband. So what does self-care look like for you? What do you do to pour back into yourself? Yeah. Um, I do a number of things. Uh, I go to therapy. I think therapy is important. Um, I create uh, space early in the morning uh, right now, whether it's uh, physical therapy and or like pool therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I like spending time in the gym. I like um, talking to people like you um, <laughs> who's, you know, in, in the, in the throes of like creating educational content and ensuring that people are learning, but also being aware of others around them. I like um, laughing with my family, uh, mm -hmm. watching movies, and doing things like that. But I think self care isn't cookie cutter either, mm -hmm. uh, because there are times when like there are things that work that are filling my tank up, and I, I feel like very full that aren't like working other times. Yeah, like I remember there was one time when I I used to ride my bike in the morning, um, and I got a lot of fulfillment out of that. And then I think, um, a my arbitrary happened, right. Yeah. Where his life was taken. And it was like, you know, sometimes being in black and brown skin, you can feel like unsafe yeah. in your body. Um, especially when you experience racialized trauma like that. And so like I had to transition to something else, mm -hmm. but the next thing I transitioned to, which was like being physically in a gym, which I felt safe, um, uh, created more, you know, fulfillment and all those things. So I think, you know, even if someone is listening to this, I think you don't start with a full plate. You just kind of gradually try things out until you find uh, what fits you. Yeah, I love that. And it's important to listen to yourself, right? Like listen to what you need yes. at that moment, right? Um, yes, yes. Sometimes it doesn't It doesn't have to be going out and doing things. Like to, to do self-care, you don't necessarily have to spend money. It can be anything like reading a book at home. Yeah. You know, it's just taking yep. that time for yourself and being mindful in the moment. Terrence, I wanted yep. to ask you, um, if you don't mind, what is your son's disability? Uh, I, I didn't even talk about it with my wife, so I, I don't want to uh, share. And okay, uh, she's not. Yeah, that's that. That, but, that um, is um, yeah. honorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't want, you know, our recovery process um, to be triggered in any way. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so <laughs> definitely I love the fact that you guys are letting him be him and that you're allowing him the space to be an individual and you're supporting him in his journey. You know, it, everybody's journey as a parent of a child with special needs is different. Um, 
my journey has been, you know, there's certain, certain things that we can find that are similar in our journeys, but like everybody's journey is, is as an individual, as a parent is very different. So, you know, I respect that. But um, I'm going to end the show how yeah. I always end it, which is follow me at okay. Comadreando Pod on Instagram. And you can follow, follow Terrence at Love Beyond Walls on IG. Yes? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, it, Love Beyond Walls or uh, I'm Terrence Lester. Okay, great. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a Comadre Gram via email at marcy at com, or slide up into my DMs. Um, I want to thank you, Terrence, again for being on the show and being so vulnerable and so open and sharing your experience with everyone. Um, and I'm, with that, I want to say good night and thank you for spending time with your comadre and your compadre. Good night. Thank you. Bye.